Hi, I'm Gretchen. And I'm Becca. And we're two curious ladies on an adventure to learn more about cooking, cannabis, and the fine art of gluttony. Join us every 10 days or so as we get high and make our way through a recipe. Step inside and let the consumption begin. <laughs> two. Oop. <laughs> Claudia. Every Claudia. time. <laughs> I always surprise myself that I'm in control. How is that possible? Know, right? We hit record and then we're like, ah, it's recording. <laughs> stoners. Fucking stoners. Yeah. Well, hello, everybody. As you can tell, we are off to a good start. What are you smoking over there, Gretchen? I am smoking Super Boof, which is a hybrid made by Crossing Black cherry punch and tropicana cookies the dominant terpene is myrcene which translates to a lot of earthy and cherry notes i can confirm this is true i do have some tropicana cookies here that i've been smoking and it is extremely earthy and this is also earthy but not quite so earthy but it's really nice what are you smoking (laughs) I also have a super in the title of my strain today, which is Super Lemon Haze. And this is a vape pen I have from Mammoth Labs. It's 70% THC and then mostly lemonine with some caryophylline and humulene in there. Very fragrant, very fun. It's, I think it's sativa leaning, or at least the terpenes are leaning towards a little more uplifting kind of vibe. I'm enjoying it. Those super blank haze, that's the family of more sativa-leaning things. I think they're mostly sativa strains. That would make sense to me if that was the case. I'm enjoying it. Honestly, I enjoy everything. I There's never been a time when I'm like, no, I don't think that's for me. But, <laughs> but I <Fair>. am enjoying <laughs> it. <laughs> and I'm glad we're both enjoying our super today because we are super (laughs) excited about starting something new this is a big day for us and we're kind of doing a thing we don't typically do in the drink department too we are having a margarita yeah we made a margarita with tons of herbs and no simple syrup which i thought was gonna be necessary But Mm -hmm. it's not. It's really smooth. I think especially because we're using a reposado with a little bit of barrel aging, it really smooths that tequila out a bit. It becomes a little bit less essential to have simple syrup. Sure. Yeah, these fresh herbs too make a big difference. Do you want to read what's in our cocktail today before we move on? Because we might not come back to this one. (laughs) So this is called an herb garden margarita. And this is from the Tesco.com site from the UK. (laughs) We didn't realize it was from Tesco when we picked it out. And I didn't realize it until I was reading the ingredients before the recording. (laughs) Yeah. And if you're not familiar with what Tesco is, it's like a Safeway or a Smith's or something like that. Imagine Safeway.com is where our recipe goes from. (laughs) Pretty much, actually. That's a really good comparison. (laughs) I've been to uh, many a Tesco. They're very similar to a Safeway. Uh, But it's tasty, so we'll take take good food from anywhere or good drinks from anywhere. (laughs) You need a For two drinks, you need 100 milliliters. Tequila Reposado, 50 milliliters of triple sec, 50 milliliters of lime juice, roughly two to three juicy limes, five mint sprigs, extra for garnish, five basil sprigs, extra for garnish, and two sprigs of thyme. And then you're going to rim the glass with a flaky sea salt, and half of a lime that's been zested. So you get a little lime zest on your rim. Then you are going to prepare that, like most margaritas, putting it into a cocktail shaker with some ice and add all those herbs, shake away for 30 seconds, and strain into a rimmed glass. First, you do add the tequila, triple second lime juice, and then those herbs. Yes. If you really want to be that specific, I was giving our people credit for knowing how a cocktail is made, but you're right. We should be very explicit. 
<laughs> well, there's no muddling or anything either. You clap the herbs. You That's clap the herbs. I wanted herbs. to specify. Liquor first, then, then herb. Then herbs. clap the herbs together to release the essential oils. <laughs> yes, I fucking love that step, the clapping. It's very messy, though. It is, and the herbs go everywhere. <laughs> I mean, right, you have, yeah. you're not, like, really clapping, clapping, but... Yeah, you know. very important to leave them on the sprigs because I went outside and picked the tops of things off because that's what's kind of okay right now outside. I should have just brought all my herbs today. I had a <laughs> heck of a time with that. But yeah, longer <laughs> stems, much easier to clap than if you've got small little pieces of herb. Just take that under advisement. Yeah, and I didn't have mint, so I used a cilantro. So imagine those little oh. <laughs> cilantro leaf spouts and all. <laughs> just the confetti party. <laughs> yeah. It's delicious, though. I highly recommend it. It's super fun. I think you could play around with the herbs. And this with my super lemon haze is just really setting like a very high energy, excited vibe right now. I know. I feel like I could go to a dance party or something. Mm, 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 Okay. mm. I'm going to boof a little bit over here. So hold on. (laughs) Enjoy your boof. I will try to set the stage a little bit about why we are bubbling over with energy. And that is because we are starting a new cookbook series. Ah! So exciting. So exciting. We had so much fun when we did our deep dive into Marcella. We'd been building on our conversations about Fanny and Ruth Graves Wakefield. Sorry, Fanny Farmer, just to be more specific there. And so we're finding ourselves more and more drawn to these just powerhouse women who are setting these standards for cooking that we did not know we were following today. So it's super exciting. We are also in a very, very fun turn of events, finally launching our Patreon. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, my God. What we're going to do today is start at the beginning of this book. We're going to share a little bit about Jeanette's philosophy, why this book exists in the first place, some of its impact, and then we're going to start in the early section and make one of her fun butters today. But what we're going to do in the Patreon is go through this book start to finish. And Gretchen and I are going to read it and we're going to chat and we're going to talk about all things food and recipes and lots of our very opinionated opinions that maybe have valid (laughs) maybe don't have any validity to them but we cannot wait because obviously as you can tell we love talking about food we love talking about cannabis and drinks and how things combine and how they connect and so we're gonna get super stoned and we're gonna read through this cookbook and we really hope that you can join us on that journey over at patreon so stay tuned for more there but today Our focus is to just set the stage for France, the cookbook. So exciting. It is super exciting. So I'm going to read a little bit from the beginning. Gretchen's going to chime in with her thoughts. And then, like I said, we're going to make a fun butter, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. But here we go. The book is France, the cookbook. The original title was Je Suis... Let me look it up. Uh, Let me just, get this right. Je suis culin- culinaire. Je, uh, je suis culinaire. Je Cuis- suis- cuisinaire. Sorry. Hold cuisinaire. On. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of French happening in this book, so I don't speak French, and I apologize oh, I to anyone who does. Gretchen does. Okay, good. Because I, I do some corrections. I do poorly because I don't <laughs> practice, but I technically speak French. I took it through most, if not all, of high school. And it's so important for food things. So mm-hmm. like, I know a fair amount of French. It's it's okay. in my wheelhouse. <laughs> Phew. Okay, good. Because I was thinking yesterday when I was reading through this, like, ah, oh, fuck. People are going to yeah. get real mad at the way <laughs> everything. But we're going to yes. do our best. Gretchen's here to so, help me as always. So I was saying, je suis cuisinaire, which is I am a cook. It's je sais cuisinaire, which is I know how to cook. So original title Je sais cuisiner, which means I know how to cook. Mm -hmm. The re-released, slightly edited version is just France, the cookbook. (laughs) It's a lot of ground to cover. (laughs) It works, I guess, yeah. The author is Jeanette Mathieu. I think so, yeah. We might call her Jenny. 
for <laughs> expediency purposes. Jeanette, yeah. Or, or Jenny, yeah. just because Gretchen wants to call her that. Yeah, we're, we've decided she's Jenny for whatever reason. Let's kick it off. I'm going to read her original intro to the book, and then we're going to read a little bit of some of the editor's notes about it in later times. Okay. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Dear friends, you want to prepare food that is not too complicated and that will turn out successfully. And isn't this because you want to please the people you are cooking for? So you've chosen this book which has long-standing, reliable reputation behind it. France, the cookbook, will be extremely useful to those men and women who want to cook. This is because a good cookbook must only offer useful information. It will avoid second-rate recipes or those that are too complicated for the way we live now. This is why I am very pleased to be introducing a well-organized work based on sound cooking principles. It must be practical and useful at a time when the need to save time and money is at the forefront of everyone's thoughts. Finally, to keep up to date, I have kept in mind those who would like to prepare modern dishes as well as traditional ones. In creating the recipes and menus, I have always been careful to follow the rules of a nutritious diet. You will also find dishes from the different regions of France. The explanations are given in the simplest possible way, and the recipes always serve six. Naturally, the time given for preparation will vary with the experience of the person who is making the dish, but at least the cook will know that some dishes are quicker to make than others. The cooking times are given accurately, from the time it comes to a boil or is put in the preheated oven. The oven temperature is always stated. This means that you can follow the recipes without fear of failure. The many letters that I have received from readers of this book since the first edition appeared have helped me supplement and make improvements to each new edition. I hope that this simple book of family food will remain my reader's favorite advisor. I want to point out my one gripe with this entire intro. Of course. (laughs) Yes. Because I love most of it. But... (laughs) As we point out in our podcast on a regular basis, because I think people get really hung up on like how recipes are written and forgetting that it's a guideline and that sometimes things are beyond your control and you will fail. I know you're supposed to be like positive mindset and everything, but I do feel like it's very important to point out that there's never a fail safe cookbook or recipe or recipe. Anything can go wrong. Of course, this is a stupid, stupid gripe to have with this book. But No, I do think it's important because I think one of the things we kind of strive to show with this podcast is how even a really simple dish can sometimes be complicated or your puff pastry isn't defrosted or your tomatoes are expired or whatever. There's always something, like you said, that's going to be out of your control. And I think one of the things that's really cool about what we do is to show that failure is like part of it sometimes. And it is always a learning. And I think you're right with like, as much as she's trying to express like a simplicity of cooking and her approach is very receivable to anybody at any stage, it is kind of disarming to say you won't fail because then if you do (laughs) fail, you really are like, well, this was fail proof. I fail all the time. And Gretchen is always there to say it's fine, or we can fix it or whatever. I do appreciate you pointing that out that it is like important to say too, especially with cooking, I think anything can happen. (laughs) Yeah, anything, anything can happen at any time. You know, as much as she and not all ovens are the same. So she's saying all the cook time are accurate. Like, I'm like, I, I, I hate that we put that level of certainty out there on cookbooks to say that just because you have this guy, there's no way you won't fail. I'm sorry. There's a statistical probability that you will at some point. <laughs> yeah. I'm really excited to go through this book because it does have a lot of these French things that are just part of our, our everyday meals but I don't have like a super appreciation for what like a Bernays sauce means or what like a hollandaise sauce means but this French cuisine is so ingrained in global cuisine too I think it's important to have this baseline understanding but also understand that these dishes while simple can be complicated 
I do think she does point that out. There was something I was reading there where she was being very fair about like, this is a saw, I think it was in the saw section. You can make, this is pr- pretty fail safe. And this, you know, you need more caution. I think she does put that in some places, but I was just like, don't tell them they'll never fail. Just right Yeah, that. totally. <laughs> I do appreciate her pointing out that like it will change depending on your skill level, like the amount of time spent will change, but that her, her time estimation is a good guide for easier or harder. At least that's a starting point. Like for me, if she's like 60 minutes prep time, I'm probably out. Like, yeah, (laughs) I might not try that unless Gretchen's like, guess what we're making next, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I will force that on you at some point, exactly. I'm sure, in this book. And I've only gotten through, like, a fifth of it, so I haven't even gotten to the good shit yet. No, I'm, like, so excited and nervous for all of the things that are going to come out of this book that Gretchen's like, ooh, oh, 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 break this, oh, break this, oh, break this, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes, I'm glad you're preparing yourself. Oh, I'm ready, I'm ready. I do think I love that she put men and women in the beginning like right up front super cool to not just be like women only cook we should also say she wrote this book in the 1930s and so putting that into perspective too like what's happening across the world and in France and we'll say this in a minute too but she was only 25 when she wrote this book also legit powerhouse lady just like (laughs) wow And then also I do, before we go on, want to set just like a little timeline perspective against the other really cool chefs that we've talked about. We'll go way back to Fanny Farmer, which kind of kicked all this off for us. And Fanny's time on earth was from 1857 to 1915. Then we've got Ruth Graves Wakefield with her chocolate chip cookie coming in 1903 to 1977. And then Jeanette Matteo is going to jump in here. And her time was from 1907 to 1998. And then our dear, dear friend, Marcella Hazan, lived from 1924 to 2013. Gretchen and I were kind of talking earlier about how, like, okay, so France the Cookbook is written in 1930s. Fanny Farmer died in 1915. But she was touring the world like right up until her death almost. She was like out there doing as much as she could until the end. And that was when she had published a couple versions and was traveling globally and just really making a name for herself. And if you'll remember, she was a home economics teacher. We'll come to learn in a minute that Jeanette was also a home economics teacher. So we were kind of saying like, did Jeanette know about Fanny? Had she, like, taken some inspiration from the way Fanny's cookbook was written in its, like, simplicity? Or did Jeanette not know at all? And this is, it's just so fun for us to kind of connect these things. Go down that I'm super stoned and I'm going to, like, think about all the things kind of rabbit hole. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. It is a lot to think about. So with that timeline in mind, I'm going to jump into what we're going to talk about next, which is the a couple of notes from the person who sort of re-edited this book later in time. And this is the version that Gretchen and I both have. She did not make a lot of changes, but she did say that she tried to like modernize a couple of the recipes in some ways in terms of like, she says, a more reasoned use of oil or butter. <laughs> or cooking vegetables and fish more briefly. So there's a couple of things in the book that we're going over that were not super, super original version. But the editor, whose name is Clotilde, says basically, like, you can, there are some recipes in this book you'll want to make exactly as written by Jeanette. But there are other ones that you should have the liberty to feel like you can make your own and make changes to. And so she sort of set that intention with re-editing this book. So initially written with the young bride in mind to guide her first steps in the kitchen and help feed her family, Je Sais Cuisine transcended this pattern as French society evolved. It is not insignificant that the author herself, a strong-headed woman whose dreams of becoming a doctor were thwarted by her conservative family, never married, 
and instead carved a successful career for herself in the French education system, leading up to her final position as a, in, as a general inspector. So I did look this up, and basically what this means is that she was in charge of the entire home economics curricula for all of France. So impressive. I, so I mean, cool. amazing. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> and she, yeah, and to be so young. I mean, I don't know at what point she achieved that, but like by the being time young. she wrote the book. Being, <laughs> how, how, I'm know, sorry. How did she achieve being young? No, I'm not sure when she became the general inspector. I don't know if it was like oh, after yeah. the book or before the book, but like since she wrote after. the book when she was 25, she already had built like a career as this home ec teacher. Her book is now used by men and women alike, regardless of their age or situation. They listen to Jeanette as they would a knowledgeable relative they can call on for tips when they have a leg of lamb to roast and future in-laws to impress. Her recipes are dependable, blissfully free of trendy antics, and it is this old school charm that explains why Je sais cuisiner remains, to this day, the best loved reference on classic French home cooking. When Je sais cuisiner was first published in 1932, Genevieve Mathieu, Jeanette is a nickname. We have furthered that nickname to Jenny, but <laughs> she was just she was just 25. As a young home economics teacher, she had been contacted by a French publisher to put together a comprehensive collection of recipes for the home cook, one that would be more practical and exacting than ever before, which is what makes me think of Fanny. That right. note about exacting. Like, yes. Yeah. It would also include, and this was a novel idea at the time, dietary considerations, but it wasn't because Fanny, Fanny had written that like convalescent. whole book. Yeah. 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 So maybe just revolutionary at the time in France. Mm -hmm. but Mademoiselle Nathio got to work, enrolled her students to help with the testing, and delivered a manuscript that contained some 1,900 recipes covering everything a homemaker needed to know about cooking, baking, and preserving. This quality simplicity, and breadth of the recipes, as well as the author's sensible voice, made the book an instantaneous success and a lasting one, too. 77 years and multiple editions later, the book has sold many millions of copies. And although Miss Matteo is no longer here to see it, because she passed away in 1998, her work has stood the test of time like no other. Yeah, she's just really such an impressive person for... The time period, especially. She's inspiring. Yeah, she is inspiring. I think you and I appreciate a very, like, straightforward approach to cooking. Like, in the moment, we want to do whatever we want to do. But I like a recipe and guidance that's, like, very straightforward and simple. And I do think it is so cool that we've already talked about Fanny and have this perspective of, like, the book she wrote and the way that she kind of changed cooking in the world for that time and how this like publisher was like we need a France version of that well yeah it's pretty forward thinking mm -hmm. I'm sure that people who were writing cookbooks at the time though they didn't really care about nutrition it wasn't the first consideration when like meal planning yes thank you that <laughs> it's perfect that's great thank you for reading my mind Becca <laughs> anytime I mean, especially bringing your students into it and ending up where she did. I always love my strong single ladies. Woo! No partners. But maybe we just don't know. Maybe she had a partner. That's true. And it was all. We don't know much. We know we like her. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we like her. Old Jenny. <laughs> Old Jenny. Although we did think for the recipe we're doing today that her time estimate was extremely ambitious. We will get into that. And that's one of the mm -hmm. things I'm super excited to get into on the Patreon, too. Talking about those time estimations and us thinking, like, how long would this really take us to do yeah. it, you know? Because we spent an hour prepping today, kind of, you know? Like, uh, yeah. Not a yeah. full hour. Let's continue, and then we'll wrap up this part from the editor here. So, the cuisine of France is among the richest and most diverse in the world. And the techniques and traditions it is built on have had a long-standing influence on chefs everywhere. 
However, this considerable reputation sometimes overshadows the profound appeal of cuisine menagerie, or French home cooking, which is anything but intimidating. It is a style of cooking based on resourcefulness and simplicity, on a wealth of national classics and regional flavors, as fit for everyday meals as for celebrations. Jeanette Mathieu's Je suis cuisine, or I know how to cook, or France the cookbook, <laughs> is the perfect illustration of this. In it, she equips her readers with the perfect building blocks for good cooking, educates them about the ingredients they'll encounter and the skills they'll need, and conveys the philosophy that that's at the heart of the French kitchen, creating maximum flavor out of a small set of ingredients and making the most of one's resources through an ingenious use of leftovers and simple preserving techniques. Written in the early 30s, the book reflects the mindset of an era when the lady of the house spent a good deal of her time at the stove. Yet Jeanette Mathieu's teachings are no less relevant today. The modern cook is just as concerned as she was about letting well-chosen ingredients shine through and adopting an economical approach to cooking. Well said. Well said, Clotilde. Oh, yeah, said. France is taking so much credit for its cuisine here, or at least Clotilde's. And it's like, I don't know. I feel like that's some colonial colonialism shit. So, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we find that in everything we do. Ooh, fun. <laughs> The last thing we wanted to read just to set the stage for the book and our Patreon before we jump into actually what we're doing a little bit more specifically today is to talk about Jeanette's cooking fundamentals. So why do we eat? Everyone more or less knows the answer. We have to eat to live. But how should we eat? This is what most people don't know and don't want to find out, despite the vast amount of information and advice given in books and magazines. That's funny. I'm just a quick aside. It's just like not the internet. It's just books and magazines. Books like, and magazines. Just, yeah. <laughs> like now we're like just the internet. Before the internet existed. Yeah. <laughs> In modern times, as the science behind food becomes better known, sometimes to the exclusion of simple pleasures, butter, our diet is too often left to habit and prejudice or depends on chance or whim. But knowing how to provide food for yourself is a science that cannot be neglected without harming your health and your family budget. Food fulfills two essential needs for our bodies. The need for energy, provided by carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, and the need for building, repairing, and keeping the body in working order, for which proteins, minerals, fiber, and water are useful. The French are appreciative and fond of their food. They won't refuse to heed dietary advice, but above all, the food must be delicious. We should therefore make every effort to satisfy these needs and create harmony between the various courses of a meal so that the palate is stimulated. The main course should be a climax of flavor without dominating the meal. Its impact will be toned down by dessert, which will create a satisfying end to the meal. Each dish should have its own special flavor, not masked by intense aromas, but rather combining them with the food to provide a background of secondary flavors or half tones that enhance the main ingredient, the backdrop to its true flavor. Everyone's life certainly would be much simpler if the meal pills promised by scientists became available, but then life would lose one of its main attractions. What is more pleasant than a properly conducted meal or a well-presented dish with an aroma so good that just smelling it makes your mouth water? Fortunately, it is still necessary to prepare most foods by cooking them to make them fit to eat. It is an opportunity to give full reign to your imagination, for cooking is an art, but the cook must also obey the rules of the kitchen because it should not be forgotten that cooking is also a science. I really like the part where she talked about the, the food fulfilling the essential needs, really mm -hmm. breaking down the purpose of each of those things. I had never, never put that together before. You need the energy and then you need the building blocks. Yeah. 
it's like we're taught biology and we're taught how these things work and then like one sentence by this woman from 1930 is like oh oh I get it. <laughs> oh oh that's food that makes sense yeah I get it now what you're saying too is how she's distinguishing why we have to eat Versus why we would like want to eat or should eat. Yes. That desire versus the actual need of food. Yes. How boring would life be without being able to eat a ham sandwich or whatever your version of a ham sandwich is? Yeah. Every once in a I while. Mean, honestly, sometimes getting to dinner is like all I strive for. <laughs> <laughs> this is adulting. We just aim for <laughs> making it to dinner time. Exactly. But then I'm like, and then I can have a good dinner. Like, that'll be fun. It does make the day worth it. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good stage setter for France the Cookbook. We're going to start with a recipe from the early part of the book, which is a ravigote butter. We are starting with the simplest thing. And in the tradition of how we did Marcella, we're going to kind of ramp up as we go along in the complexity here. But this is also kind of a great building block, especially if you want to get into French cooking and the importance of butter in French cooking. But I don't think we have time to quite get into that today. We can only lightly touch. This particular butter, the name Ravigote, comes from a French term that pretty much means pick me up, which is from the verb Ravigotier, which is to cheer and to strengthen. And this includes tarragon, chervil, chives, and burnet, minced very, very fine. Traditionally, this was used as a garnish on salads. You would have little dishes that they'd bring around with the salads of tarragon, chervil, uh, chives, and burnet. And you would dress your salad with a little bit of each of those herbs as much as you like. The butter we're making today, you can use it by itself as a sauce for something. But it also can be used as a base for additional ravigot sauces. It's got multi-purposes and will help us transition into our next episode where we are going to be talking about and making a sauce. We're really kind of going back to basics with these recipes. (laughs) We really are. I think it's exciting. So a ravigot is this combination of herbs and it can be used in multiple ways. Correct. Yes. Okay. So you can use it. You've got rabbit goat sauce. And I believe the original idea for it was as this herb mixture. That's the name of the herb mixture. Yes. So we're going to put that into our a butter today. Correct. But it is not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> we are making a slightly complex butter in that we're going to massage some blanched herbs into the butter, and then we're going to sieve that softened, massaged butter to get all of the solids out before we set that butter aside to sit and rest for whatever application you want to use it for. So we are going to boil those herbs, which was one large handful of chervil, chives, tarragon, and watercress, or some combination of herbs. (laughs) For us today, we're not doing exactly that, but that's okay. And then a third cup of butter softened, and then just salt and pepper. Super simple ingredients, but like Gretchen said, it's an interesting process of of boiling those herbs and then kneading them into the butter and then trying to strain the herbs out. It was kind of hard for me to picture. Should we read the recipe? Yeah, let's read the recipe. For those who have the book, this recipe is on page 48. Bring a pan of water to boil and put the herbs into the boiling water for about three minutes. Drain well and chop the herbs finely. So we are thoroughly chopping them. Fine chop. Fine chop. Knead them into the butter and then pass the butter through a strainer to remove the solids. Put the butter into the center of a small sheet of wax paper or aluminum foil and use this to roll the butter into a log. Chill until required. When ready to serve, unwrap the butter, cut it crosswise into coin shapes, and then place one on top of each serving. This goes well with fish dishes. Not for Gretchen. Yeah. What? Chicken. Chicken. Yeah, chicken. 
I mean, I, I think it would go well with a lot of things. What was her time estimation? So she said five minutes, which I think I was, no, I mean, five only minutes? five minutes. Literally, I feel like it's going to take me five minutes to just put the butter onto the strainer. Putting butter through a sieve or a strainer, you're going to push that through. That's going to take a little bit of work. Now, we are talking about only a third of a cup, and it will be softened butter. It's not going to be cold butter, which would feel like, not feel like, probably be impossible. (laughs) Unless you're very, very strong and have a really strong sieve. There's only so much pressure. It's not going to melt with us, like, kneading the herbs in, right? Not complete. It should completely it's, melt. But it'll but you, soften a lot. It'll soften. And one suggestion I am going to make is wearing gloves when you're kneading it. Especially if you put on more than one pair, that'll help keep the heat from your hands from completely softening the butter. Good point. Yeah. Okay. Five minutes. What else do we need to know before we move into the kitchen? What world level is this? Oh, this is a one. The only complexity here is having to drain the herb, you know, boil and drain the herbs. And that's not hard. That's just blanching. (laughs) Okay, we got it. And I did ask Gretchen, what's the purpose of boiling them? Is it to kind of remove the texture a little bit? And she let me know that it was just to mostly preserve the color. But why preserve the color if you're going to push them out? I'm thinking that the actually it does serve another purpose. I was a little bit mistaken. It will also help break down the herbs a little bit. So I think we'll end up with a bit of a green color that comes out that's in the butter itself. Cool. And so boiling it preserves the brightest, most vibrant green color you can get instead of it turning kind of brown or gray, which happens when herbs start to oxidate. Mm -hmm. So you stop that oxidation process by boiling them. And also it'll break down the cell walls and you'll be able to get a a little more extraction during that kneading process. And extended clapping to remove essential oils. (laughs) Correct. Yes. Extended extended (laughs) clapping. Yes. (laughs) Okay. I'm ready. I think I'm ready. Should we go into the kitchen? I think so. Okay. We are in the kitchen. I was wondering too about the boiling, if it removes any purities or dirt or whatever you know i mean it can for sure and i salted my water oh okay okay we're going off book let's do it there's water boiling it's got to be salty. yeah okay Uh, yeah i always add more salt (laughs) more salt more butter yes more salt more butter our water's boiling we're about to put our herbs in at which point they're going to Boil for three minutes, and then we will strain those and chop them. Yes. Let's do it. Let's do it. We've also got our gloves on, our surface prepared for kneading our butter. We are ready. We're ready. Oh, we didn't talk about my weird combo of herbs because neither one of us could find chervil today. Yes. Yeah. Please tell us about what you ended up with. While we wait for these herbs to boil. I also neglected to buy chives at the store because I normally have so many chive plants around the yard that I don't worry about running out of chives but alas I've moved them all around so I have no chives at my house the one time yeah so I had to find a few little sprigs of Egyptian walking onion and a little bit of shallot that I threw in there for my onion flavor and I got some salad burnet from my yard which is burnet as well as some nasturtium leaves for a little bit of that spice like the watercress would have. Okay, what is burnet and what is nasturtium? Is that how you say it? Nasturtium. What? How do you not know what nasturtium is, Becca? I don't know. I remember you said it earlier and I was like, what is this? Is that a word? I I mean, I thought you were confused, but I just thought because of the application for the... I'm actually going to pull my my herbs back out because they're very bright, pretty green, and I just don't want them to go to a dark side. Okay. Don't go to the dark side. Here come my herbs. Uh, Nasturtium is more of a flower. It's an annual. And it has a very spicy flavor to it. And the flower is edible as well as the seeds. And you can pickle the seeds. So they're kind of an interesting plant, but they are 
toward the spicy side of things. And Burnett is a pretty unusual one that you wouldn't come across unless you know what it is. Or an, 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 are an herb nerd like I am. Herb nerd. <laughs> we should make that a t-shirt. <laughs> herb nerd. Yes, I think so. Okay. So I'm just it, taking a couple stems off before I chop these herbs real quick. Okay. I'm chopping mine and okay. um, trying to get them cooled down a little bit because I'm like, oh, these are warm. So I'm not sure if they... Might not also break down the butter a little bit just because they're hot, but we'll find out. Okay, herbs are chopped. It's time to knead. And then what was Burnett again? Burnett, for you herb nerds, fellow herb nerds, <laughs> is a more of a lettuce thing that has a very like bright, refreshing cucumber-like flavor to it. And it grows pretty easily. I have it all over my yard now because I started growing it a few years ago because the rabbits actually like it. (laughs) So I have it everywhere. (laughs) It grows very easily here in Napa. Burnett fields for days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much turned my whole front yard into that for the bunnies. Lucky bunnies. They are so lucky. They're so spoiled. We did not mention that we have lost a member of the land, the fern bunnies. Mm -hmm. Uh, since our last recording. Pod died very suddenly from a heart attack. So we are down to Luce and Aria in the bunny department. And they're getting along okay. (laughs) They might be friends someday. We'll see. I should take a picture of this now that I've kneaded it together. Okay, so you finished kneading. So very much looks like maitre d' butter. So basically what we're making is like what we would say a compound butter, right? Yes. Yes. Tell me a little bit about compound butters and what rabbit goat, like where does it fall into that? Compound butter is just really a butter with shit mixed in. Not okay. shit. Not shit. Stop. No, with, with, with herbs. Flavorings. Sorry. With goody things. Yeah, Good delicious. things. Not, not, not bad things. Sorry. Not literal but, shit. But it's not just like the butter you pull out of your fridge. It's got an extra juge to it Jeez, and, yes and most of the time that's like herbs herbs you can put like chopped up dried fruit or you could make a peach and herb butter spicy butters like miso garlic leafy. butter yeah miso but that yeah the okay. miso herb butter we made that would definitely be considered a compound butter so we've done this before we just didn't put it in those terms what we're doing today is in the family of what we'd call a compound butter Correct. At this stage where we've kneaded the herbs into the butter, and then what we're going to do now, though, with the ravigot butter, and again, the ravigot just means that this type of herbs that we're using. Correct. Is there a name for what we're doing next with trying to get the herbs out and just get it back to looking like a plain butter, but with all this infusion of herbs? No, I mean, I still think it just falls under the compound butter. It just won't have the herbs hanging Mm -hmm. out in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to now try to strain out the chunks of herbs that are in this butter. Okay. Yes. Yes, we are. Are you just going to, like, do it over your wax paper or something? Yes, that's exactly what I was going to do. I'm going to use a smaller, not my biggest strainer, although I was tempted to do that because it would fit a spatula better but since mm-hmm. I have my dream farm small spatulas it might work out okay so your approach is going to be to use a spatula to kind of push, it, push through. it through okay we'll okay. see how that goes I am also using the spatula to get as much of the butter off the sill pat as possible before I do that just as okay. a additional reason to use a spatula this seems to be working there is some small bits of the herbs that are coming through the screen. Yeah, that was one of the reasons why I was surprised to chop the herbs finely as opposed to leaving them more whole. Yeah. But I think it is because then you get a light smattering of herb that can go through the sieve. Yeah, it's real delicate then. Mm-hmm. I think my only problem with the sieving process, it feels like I'm leaving a lot of butter in the sieve. I totally agree. And I have to say for me, I don't care if the herbs are in it. So, like, (laughs) I'm wasting a lot of butter just to remove these herbs. 
<laughs> that is my main gripe, yes. It's not that much butter. I've got a pretty good volume going on over here, actually. Do you? I got a metal mm -hmm. spoon out to push part of it through to scrape some of the ends That's off true. the, yeah. I just like scraped a whole bunch of it together and then it flew off the spoon onto the floor. So I guess I'm oh, done. Sad. Yeah, you're done. Just do one more scrape off the uh, underside. Yeah, I feel like this uh, having to boil and strain and then chop and then put it massage. Like this is just not something I'm going to do. Like, yeah, I literally feel like I only ended up with like two tablespoons. I mean, is that it looks like a bit at least. Oh, yours is a nice color. Oh, thanks. It's pretty. I ended up you with still... almost a third of a cup. So about the same as you started. Yeah. I lost a lot to my plastic gloves. I lost a lot to the strainer. There's um, a lot of places to lose butter here, unfortunately. Yeah. Also, when were we supposed to put in the salt and pepper? Oh, we can do it now. Still just mix it in. Okay. We should have put it in when we were kneading it. Ah, yes, that would have made sense. But I didn't see that on the recipe. So. I don't think it was. I think it was implied, but not actually written. Mm, Jeanette. Jenny. Jenny! I mean, I think maybe if I was doing a larger volume of butter, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. this small of an amount, because we now know that all of her recipes are for six servings, seems a little pointless. But I could see doing this in a larger volume. And yeah. it making sense. I agree. I would, I am sad to lose this amount of butter we lost today. Mm -hmm. But if it were like triple this amount, it would feel, it would make sense to me to lose yeah. a little bit, you know, like, I feel like we would lose the same amount too, if it was triple. It's just a matter of like, it, right. It's the, the it through, proportion. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm with you. I think I'm optimistic. This is going to taste really, really good. But for me, not worth the work. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll just put herbs in my butter. Keep going. Yeah, I think that's, <laughs> yeah, it's a way easier option. But I did like that you <laughs> picked this one just because of it, how it was a weird. Yeah, thing. it was, I never imagined straining butter through a strain. <laughs> so you toasted bread. I'm just using a cracker, but it's taste time. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. So good. So good. I'm glad I'm not biting into herbs also. <laughs> So I get it. I, get I it. think I think the boiling just softens the herbs just that little bit. So it's kind of nice because, yeah, they impart a lot of flavor while not leaving behind so much of the, the material, the leaf material. Yeah, like the butter still shines, but then what's left on your tongue is the herbs. Mm -hmm. So good. Mm -hmm. So good. Well, then I would say we are off to a good start with France the Cookbook. I think so. Uh-huh. <laughs> she says with a mouthful of butter of butter mm -hmm. <laughs> our favorite thing yeah butter yeah butter i'm so excited we're going to dig in a lot more into the book we're going to chat about all of these weird connections and all of our thoughts and everything as we go so join our patreon oh my gosh i can't believe it's happening oh my gosh, oh my gosh. <laughs> it only took three years no problem <laughs> It only took three years, and here we are. So more to come. Stay tuned. Really good with the margarita, too, this butter. Because the herbs are complementary. Yeah, but mm. different. So you get, that, different. you get that minty, basil-y, mm. and then it's like, ooh, tarragon's here to join the party. So they're Hello, all like tarragon. <laughs> all grooving together. Real disco. Yeah. I love it. So Okay, Jeanette. We are only one recipe into your thousands of pages. So <laughs> here we go. We're settling in for the journey. I'm really excited now. And next we're doing sauces. Like Gretchen said, we're going to do a fun little tomato sauce and see how it holds up to our Marcella fave. Here mm -hmm. we go. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook and we are getting the website updated it is coming along there are recipes there that were not there before <gasps> 2023 we are finally back to the website as a thing <laughs> okay so more to come sauces next time 
lots more France the Cookbook on our Patreon, and then who knows where we're going to go from there. So who knows? Thanks for joining us, Gluttoneers. We're excited about what's next. Off we go. Off we go. I think I'm a little drunk. I am definitely a little drunk. Yeah. <laughs> I might be a lot a drunk. A little drunk. I know, Quiet. I like want yeah. another one. <laughs> yeah, I know. They're really good. Oh, so tasty. Okay. Ah, <laughs> oh, clap, clap, oh, clap, clap, oh, clap, 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 clap